propaganda and corrupt politicians Cause they own my special interest groups that fund their campaign That's why you hear the same old things they claim but change never came It's a dirty game maintained by rain for capital gain But my people getting tired of Welcome to the Project Censored Show, I'm your host, Mickey Huff A half a century has passed since the day the Ohio National Guard troops shot and killed Four students wounding nine others at Kent State University. On this week's Project Censored show, we hear perspectives on the significance of Kent State today. We'll have excerpts from the over four hours of interviews I conducted recently with eight people associated with Kent State. I interviewed academics, sociopolitical historians, protesters, massacre survivors, and others on issues related to May 4th, 1970 regarding the Kent and later Jackson State massacres. Tune in to the discussions as we explore never-before-discussed topics around May 4th, 1970 at Kent State University, what it means to all of us then and now. Welcome back to the Project Censored Show. I'm your host, Mickey Huff. History matters. Today's program focuses on Kent State at 50, the 50th teach-in. At truthtribunal.org, we worked at Project Censored with Laurel Krauss to conduct eight interviews over four hours with sociopolitical historians, protesters, and massacre survivors on issues related to May 4, 1970, then and now. We hope these perspectives enrich your understanding of this important historical event and provide context for where we are as a society today, especially on matters of war and peace, civil and human rights, and how we can work together to create a more just and equitable world. On today's show, we share excerpts of these interviews, including with historian Peter Kuznick, who will be up first. He's the co-author with Oliver Stone of The Untold History of the United States. Peter Kuznick talks about the 1969 and 1970 period when President Richard Nixon escalated the Vietnam War into Cambodia, triggering intensified anti-war protests on U.S. college campuses. After Peter Kuznick, we'll hear from Joseph Lewis, who was a survivor of the Kent State shootings. He'll tell us about his memories of that day and media fabrications about it and what lessons society ought to learn. After that, we'll hear from Laurel Krauss, sister of Allison Krauss, who was murdered at Kent State on that day. She'll talk about her family's long legal battle for accountability and wrap up with DeRay McKesson for a perspective from a member of a new generation of peace and justice activists. We spoke to DeRay McKesson from DeRay.com. DeRay is a activist noted for his work at Ferguson and beyond as part of Black Lives Matter. So on today's Project Censored show, the Kent State 50th Teach-In, we'll share these interview excerpts with you. Up next, Peter Kuznick. We had been living in a climate of violence for years around the Vietnam War, around the urban uprisings in the United States, around the increasing confrontations with the police and the military over and over again. I mean, that was really the world we lived in. Uh, there was a lot of violent repression of, of meetings, of conferences, of demonstrations. I mean, there was, so the police were always a presence. And we always knew that the line between uh, uh, keeping order, in quotes, and overt violence was pretty thin one here in the United States, not just overseas. So the, the news that the students had been shot and killed at Kent State was shocking to us, shocking to me personally. On one level, it could have been any of us at any time on any campus. There had already, I think even before that, been a student killed by the National Guard at uh, Ohio State. There was later going to be the shooting of, of the African-American students at Jackson State on May 15th, early in the morning. So this was the climate of violence. But once you saw the images of the kids at Kent State lying there, we've been predicting for a long time that the violence that they were unleashing in Vietnam, in Cambodia, and Laos and elsewhere could also be visited upon us. 
So when Kent State happened, it was just the concretization, really, of the violence of the state that the American leaders were willing to unleash, not only in Vietnam, but also on Americans. You have to remember that how much killing was going on at the time. Robert McNamara came into my class a few years ago and said that he accepts the fact that 3.8 million Vietnamese died in the war. So any government that is willing to cause the deaths of 3.8 million Vietnamese and a million Laotians and Cambodians is not going to mourn the death of a handful of American students. For me, I knew that reality already because I was already radicalized. But for many others, this was really a wake-up call. And so on top of the reaction to the invasion of Cambodia, which was tearing the country apart already, then once this hit, the campuses exploded. The combination of the invasion of Cambodia, the bombing of North Vietnam again, and the killings at Kent State was really enough to create what many people at the time said was a civil war. The ruling class, the people in charge, the Kissingers and the others were very concerned about what was happening in American society, and they actively feared a rebellion, and, and that was the mood on campus. For example, I had been in Chicago in the summer of 1968 for the Democratic Convention, and what happened in Chicago, the commission that reviewed it afterwards, the official government commission, said it was a police riot, and it certainly was a police riot. The Democratic Party had been identified as the party of the Vietnam War. There were some peace candidates we were supporting, but basically the Democratic Party apparatus then, like the Democratic Party leadership now, was center-right. So we were there to protest in the streets and in the parks and challenge the establishment, and they unleashed enormous amount of violence against us there. They not only clubbed and beat the protesters there, but they also beat the media. And so the, the press was also getting pulverized and pummeled by these thugs. And so they were much more sympathetic than they would have been. And some of it was captured on national television. So there was that kind of climate. So Kent State occurs a little bit later, but we knew that that potential existed and was just beneath the surface, it was just being held beneath the surface. And, you know, and, and we also knew what was happening to other groups. We saw the murder of the, the Panthers. We saw the COINTELPRO operations. We knew the repressive apparatus was there. So what happened with Kent State was tragic, but it wasn't shocking to us. But it did shock a lot of people who hadn't gotten to the point where some of us were. In 1969, there have been those major mobilizations. October 15th, the moratorium, millions participated in that. November 15th, the rally in Washington, D.C., at least a half million people participated in that. Huge anti-war march, the biggest up to that point ever. And, and so because of that, Nixon had to cancel his plans for Operation Duck Hook, which was going to be vicious, savage, he described it. And they even talked about using nuclear weapons there. But they had to cancel that. We didn't know it at the time, but they were obsessed with the anti-war movement. John Dean, Nixon's White House counsel, has come into my class quite a few times. And he tells my students that one of the things Nixon assigned him to do was to monitor the anti-war movement. He was obsessed with what we were doing. They changed their plans accordingly. So with Operation Duck Hook got canceled. And now he looks like in his Vietnamization policy, He's going to pull U.S. troops out. Then Nixon goes on television, he makes his speech, he announces the incursion into Cambodia and the new bombing of North Vietnam. And the one who egged him on to doing this, to the incursion into Cambodia, the invasion of Cambodia, was Henry Kissinger, of course. So things break out immediately. As there were demonstrations that very night that the invasion of Cambodia was announced. Then the next day, Nixon goes to the Pentagon and he gives this rallying cry, and he calls the protesters bums. And that day, the country went wild. That week, even before Kent State, there were far more than 100 strikes. There was a big meeting at Yale, and they called for a national student strike. 
So there were well over 100 campuses. Across the country, altogether, more than 500 campuses went out on strike or shut down for part of that week. What happened at Kent State is also very interesting because that first day, 500 students rallied at Kent State. They started fighting against the police who were sent in there to control them. They burned down the ROTC building. When the firefighters come to try to put out the fire, they cut the hoses. Then there's these confrontations, and the governor calls for a curfew first, and then he calls for sending in the National Guard. What he says about the students, this is Governor James Rhodes. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, you've got Spiro Agnew, but then Rhodes was the worst of all. He says the anti-war protesters are worse than the Nazi brown shirts and the communist element and the night riders and the vigilantes. They are the worst type of people that we harbor in America. Then the National Guard comes in there. The guard, they're told to keep their rifles locked and loaded. And then they open a fire. In 13 seconds, 61 shots are fired. Four kids are killed, nine wounded. It was a slaughter. Then even more hell breaks loose. And every campus just about the United States is seeing tremendous protests, strikes, shutdowns. So there was this kind of activism in the air. And it continued. And, and it grew for the next week. And if you look at the reports from the President's Commission or from the quote-unquote experts who were speaking at the time, they said that what we see is profound radicalization of students in the United States. It's the KPFA Spring Fund Drive. This is the time where we ask all of you to do what you can to help support this viable public resource. This is true community radio supported only by you, the listeners. No underwriting, no corporate advertising, no Koch Brothers money, etc. So what we need in this very trying time when we need access to information We need to support stations like KPFA, Free Speech Radio. This is where you're going to get news and information that you may not be getting from other sources. And that's why we're asking you to pledge at kpfa.org. Call in during the hour, 1-800-439-5732. That's 800-HEY-KPFA. Our goal for the hour, we would love to be able to get $3,000 this hour, during the Project Censored show. That's our caller goal. That's 20 callers at $150 or more each. That'll get us to our goal. And what KPFA is doing for the fund drive this spring is they are donating 10% of what you give to one of the many approved list of featured nonprofits that's on the KPFA website. So KPFA, during these pandemic times, will turn around and take your generosity and pay it forward to one of these amazing community groups, whether it's the Alameda County Food Bank, California Food Bank, San Francisco Marin Food Bank, UndocuFund SF, UndocuFund Sonoma County, Oakland Undocumented Relief Partners, COVID Migrant Youth Relief Fund, National Mamas Bailout, or Sweet Relief and They asked us as programmers to choose one for our show. And at the Project Censored show for today, we chose Sweet Relief. They provide immediate assistance and they have created a donor-directed fund with a limited amount of funds available to be used specifically for musicians and music industry workers affected by the coronavirus. Funds raised will go towards medical expenses, lodging, clothing, food, and other vital living expenses for those impacted due to sickness or loss of work. Sweet Relief Musicians Fund provides financial assistance to all types of career musicians and music industry workers who are struggling right now. We all have so much that we get out of music. And in these times of crisis, we turn to our artists and musicians and filmmakers and so many others. And it's really important that when possible, we try to give back. And so for today's program on Project Censored for the hour... We are trying to raise $3,000. That'd be 20 callers at $150 or more. And we're going to also see the station donate a percentage of that to Sweet Relief. 
You can learn more at kpfa.org. You can also pledge securely online at kpfa.org. But now I want to get to today's program. So I'll cut in later and remind you what we're doing, and you all know the drill. But I will certainly cut in and uh, repeat that request that those of you that in these tough times that are able to give, please give what you can. We know many people are struggling and are unable to, and we appreciate any support that you can give, even sharing the 94.1 radio station, right? Just sharing that station with your friends, your relatives, family, the website. Such a great resource in these trying times, kpfa.org. Listening to the Project Censored Show on Pacifica Radio, I'm your host, Mickey Huff. On today's show, the Kent State 50th Teach-In, we are looking at perspectives around the May 4, 1970 Kent State Massacre. We will hear from Joseph Lewis, a survivor of the Kent State shootings, coming up next. Stay with us. May 4th, 1970, the campus at Kent State had been occupied by 900 Ohio National Guardsmen. The rules were these. The campus was open as usual. Classes were going on, but the Ohio National Guard was going to enforce a limit of no more than four people could gather together on the campus at any one place. So this was an impossible situation. Friends of mine had been assaulted the night before, Sunday night, on the front campus when they violated the curfew, were told that they could speak with the president of the university and the mayor but then at curfew time, the National Guard had surrounded them and bombarded them with tear gas and chased them with bayonets back onto campus. And there were several people who were injured that night. And so that combination uh, and seeing students herded at bayonet point into their dorms on campus that night convinced me that I wanted to at least lend my presence to the opposition of the invasion and occupation of our campus by 900 National Guardsmen. And so the morning of May 4th, 1970, I went out and joined the crowd of students on the commons in an effort to lend my body, my presence, to the statement that we don't want you here, these guardsmen. The guardsmen were lined up on a, across the commons with their uh, gas masks, helmets, and bayonets and rifles. And the students were uh, the whole field away from them on the hillside near behind Taylor Hall. The guardsmen uh, sent out the Jeep and told uh, through a megaphone, they made the announcement, students of Kent State, this is an illegal assembly. Return to your dormitories. And it was absurd because, as I said, campus was open, classes as usual. I'd saved through my whole high school uh, summertime work to be able to afford to go to school there. And if anyone was in the wrong place, the guardsmen were, because we were on the campus where we paid to attend. In fact, through the whole activities of Monday, I was never more than 50 yards from my room, which was at the end of Johnson Hall, very close to Taylor Hall. So I was never really where I shouldn't be. Um, And I felt like we had the right to express our opposition to government policy in Vietnam and, and, and the occupation of the campus. And so myself and others, we felt like we were free to express our First Amendment rights and our right to a free assembly and uh, thought that we were we were doing that and within within the law. And I, I admit there was, being 18, you have uh, a sense of uh, justice, I think, that uh, tends to be modified as you get older and, and experienced. Um, but I was still in that mode where I thought we should fight for liberty and justice for all. And so the guardsmen failed to have everybody leave when they told us to. And so they stepped forward, a few, a handful of men stepped forward and fired tear gas across the space between the guardsmen and the students. And, uh, and it, was, it was a macabre situation where students would cover their faces with a wet rag and throw the tear gas canisters back. And it was like a, uh, it was like a competition There were cheers and there were boos, uh, and that was also unsuccessful at dispersing the students. So then the guardsmen moved out, 
moved forward towards the crowd of students on the hills side across the field from them. And we dispersed uh, in front of them. And I went between Taylor Hall and Johnson Hall, which was my dorm, and walked up the hill between them and then over to one side, allowing these guardsmen to pass between the buildings. And then they drove, walked down the hill to the other side where they were on the practice football field. The students, and myself included, kind of reassembled on the hillside overlooking them from between the two buildings. When they got down there, they made an announcement over the bullhorn that students of Kent State, we have you surrounded, which was really silly and ludicrous to hear because from where I stood, the guardsmen were on a practice football field that had a cyclone fence on two sides of it and then a hilltop covered with students on the other side. And so if anyone was surrounded, it appeared to be them. It didn't make any sense. They weren't executing any plan it didn't look like. But they were getting harassed from the Prentice Hall parking lot. There were a few people throwing gravel. People say throwing rocks. They were throwing gravel. You know, I actually told some guys that, you know, don't, don't throw rocks because it was doing nothing but aggravating. I mean, there was no point to it. But they were getting harassed, and, and at that side of the field is where Alan Canfora, my blood brother now, was holding a black flag. And it was because just a, a couple of weeks before this, one of his friends from high school had been killed in Vietnam. But he held the black flag, and, and they uh, knelt down at that end of the, of the practice football field and aimed their rifles towards Alan and his flag and towards a vociferous group of students who were harassing them at that end of the field. And so that went on for a time. And then there was a huddle, a group of guardsmen met in the field. And I'm not sure what their conversation included, but it, I, I can attribute some nefarious kind of sentiment to them at that point. Because they got up, turned around, and began to retrace their steps back up the hill from which from where they had come and coincidentally straight towards me. And many of us thought that, you know, they were returning to where they had come and that it was over, that they had done their best to disperse the crowd and that they were returning to their starting point. So I was very near to them by coincidence when they turned and started to walk up the hill. And so I moved to one side. I was 18 and foolish, but not that foolish. When they started walking towards me with the bayonets, I, I moved over to the other side. And so they walked up past me. The ground in front of me puffed up in little puffs of dirt. I was struck by a bullet. I was knocked to the ground. The gunfire lasted for 13 seconds. For many reasons, I'm very lucky to be alive. But it was a peaceful protest. None of the students did anything that deserved to be responded to in that way. And so after I was knocked to the ground and the gunfire ended after 13 seconds, there was a pause, a dead silent pause, and then screaming and all hell broke, chaos broke loose as students realized what had happened and realized what they had just witnessed. And so after three weeks and a day in the hospital, I was back at my parents' house in Maslin, Ohio, and the local paper came out with a story covering the Kent State shootings. And it said that students had attacked guardsmen with bricks and bottles and overturned cars and set them on fire, and not a word of that was true. Not any of that had happened in reality. There were many efforts to try and obtain justice. The first judicial step came in October of 1970 with the Portage County Grand Jury. Now, this is Portage County, Ohio, and they had people come in and testify in secret in the grand jury setting, including students and guardsmen and professors. And when they were done, they had 25 indictments. 25 students and professors were indicted, and I was arrested. I was shot twice and arrested for misdemeanor, participating with four or more others to block official action was my charge. 
second degree riot. And so one of the lessons I've taken away is that you can't believe anything that the media or the government says. Listening to the Project Censored Show on Pacifica Radio, I'm your host, Mickey Huff. This is the Spring Fun Drive for KPFA, and we're asking you to pledge securely online if you can. www.kpfa.org. You can call in 800 439 5732. That's 800 439 5732. We're trying to get $3,000 this hour. That's our goal. If we had 20 people calling in with $150 or more, we would make that goal. And we are also contributing 10% of all monies raised this hour to the nonprofit Sweet Relief. They provide immediate assistance and have created a donor-directed fund with limited amount of funds available to be used specifically for musicians and music industry workers affected by coronavirus. This money will go to help pay medical expenses, lodging, clothing, food, and other vital living expenses for those impacted due to sickness or loss of work. Sweet Relief Musicians Fund provides financial assistance to all types of career musicians and music industry workers who are now struggling as a result of COVID-19. We've all received a lot of joy uh, over the years uh, from the music that people create and musicians and artists and in this time of struggle, it's time to give a little back. So Sweet Lif- Relief is the organization we chose today on Project Censored for your additional support. We know it's tough times, and we know many of you that listen do what you can to spread the word about free speech radio here at KPFA. But we also know that there are some of you out there that can afford uh, $10, $15 a month, that kind of a of of a level that'll get us to what we need, right? If we have twenty callers coming in at one hundred and fifty or more, that means we get our goal three thousand dollars, and we really need to keep KPFA running in these trying times. This program, by the way, today I worked with at Project Censored in the Kent State Truth Tribunal with Laurel Krauss. We put together four hours of content for free. This is the fiftieth anniversary of the Kent State massacre. I actually did my graduate work in history on the Kent State Massacre, right around the 25th anniversary. And over the years, I have certainly stayed involved with Kent State historiography and the controversies around it. I was one of the first people with Laurel Krauss to break the news of new forensic evidence from Stuart Allen that came out eight years ago. We ran that right here on KPFA with Stuart Allen and with Laurel Krauss. We've run Never Heard Before Testimony from people who were at Kent State that day. Elaine Wellen, a sociologist at Sonoma State. And for this special, we interviewed eight people about their experiences. Some of them there, some of them shot there that day, some of them lost loved ones. Others are historians and scholars and filmmakers and activists, including social justice activists like DeRay McKesson of Black Lives Matter, David Swanson for World Beyond War. This is a really great series of interviews, oral histories, if you will. And we're sharing those with you today today. Here on the Project Censored Show, these are the narratives, the untold histories that so many books don't cover and so many commercial stations won't hear and they won't air these views. Michael Moore said, 50 years after the Kent State killings, justice still has not been served. The Kent State Truth Tribunal brings us closer to that goal by sharing firsthand accounts with the public. I am grateful for their efforts and hopeful that someday the truth will come out. Well, that's part of what we were doing in these talks that we're sharing with you today. Peter Kuznick, Joseph Lewis, who was shot and wounded there at Kent State that day, May 4, 1970. Filmmaker David Zeiger of Sir No Sir. Critical pedagogy scholar Ira Shore. Draft resistance 
organizer and artist Joel Ice, Black Lives Matter, DeRay McKesson, Dave Swanson and Laurel Krauss, Laurel, the sister of Allison Krauss. I interviewed these folks, and this stuff's all up at truthtribunal.org. But Anthony Fest, our great producer, put all this together to share in special fun drive programming about Kent State University for the Project Censored show for this specific spring fund drive. So we're sharing it with you. We're really grateful for the platform we have here at KPFA. We're on about 50 stations around the country through Pacifica and Affiliates. And this is our home station. And we're very grateful to be here with so many fantastic programmers and such a great audience in the Bay Area. So thank you for tuning in and for all of your support. 1-800-439-5732. 1-800-439-5732. That's the number to call. KPFA.org online is the way you can securely pledge on the internet, www.kpfa.org. There's a slew of other organizations that the station is partnering with to share donations. So please feel free to peruse the website and take a look at what KPFA is offering. Today, we're going to be donating some of the percentage to the Sweet Relief Fund for musicians struggling during COVID-19. With that, I would like to go back to sharing with you excerpts from Facing the Kent State Massacre's 50th Anniversary and our Kent State 50th Teach Him. You're listening to the Project Censored Show. I'm your host, Mickey Huff. We're talking about the 50th anniversary of the Kent State Massacre. And up next, we have Laurel Krauss. Her sister, Allison, was murdered at Kent State, May 4, 1970. And Laurel told me about her family's long legal battle for accountability and more. Here is Laurel Krauss from the Kent State Truth Tribunal. My sister, Allison, she's my older sister. She was 19, an honor student at Kent State. I was 15. I learned about it getting off the school bus, uh, going home. At 15, when things like that happen, it changes your life forever. It also instilled in me a lifelong goal of finding truth at Kent State and fighting for my sister. That's what it meant to me. But it also meant a lot to my family. My parents took Kent State to the courts, and it was a very hard battle because the courts were very close to seeking truth and accountability when it was matters related to the government. My father actually had to take it all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court to get the right to sue the uh, state of Ohio related to the killing of four and wounding of nine at Kent State. And he won. Ohio was a sovereign state. And so his, my father's victory, my father, Arthur Krauss, his victory was to be able to bring suit and ask for accountability from the governor and, and all the people in the state. They weren't above the law. And this changed the laws for all sovereign states across America, not just Ohio. So that was probably about the biggest thing we ever got out of our search for truth and accountability at Kent State. I've had the opportunity to take it to the United Nations in 2014. We're all interested in truth and accountability, especially when it's related to wrongful acts, massacre acts of the government. What we found when we were seeking truth and accountability at Kent State was that the government didn't want us seeking truth and accountability at Kent State. And they were doing everything in their power to stop us. For the 10 years following the Kent State massacre, when my father was suing the government, nine years of litigation ended up with $15,000 in a statement of regret. And it was a phony statement of regret on top of it. you know. And the $15,000 was really more of a slap in the face. $15,000 for my sister's life. I mean, how ridiculous. But anyhow, we became targets of the government because we sought truth and accountability at Kent State. And and Kent State seems to be an Achilles heel of government wrongdoings. (laughs) It's blatantly obvious that the massacre was perpetrated by the government. My sister was killed by a government bullet. Let that sink in government bullet 
And it's just never been about that, the Kent State story that the government did it. We're not allowed to because the media is trained. Those who train the media, which my theory is these days it's the CIA, that's what they think their job is. And now they've perpetrated all the cable media with all these security analysts that are interpreting the news for us and all the defense people. Anyhow, we get the world through the TV and news. It's about war and propagating war and supporting war and not about someone like my sister, Allison, who stood for peace and actually protested against the war and got gunned down while she was protesting against the war. That's criminal. A government isn't allowed to kill a protester. No. And when they do, because they do, then they have to follow certain procedures. They have to do a, a higher level of credible investigation. None of that is happening in Kent State. We're not allowed that. They have to do certain actions to make amends. The opposite of that has been true. Just take a look at what's going on at the 50th. Not one word of amend, not one word of apology, not one word of, we shouldn't have done this. And four people died. And the other nine, that was attempted murder or target assassination, as they say at the United Nations. So how does it affect now? What happened to my family back then is we had them on our telephones. They were in our mailboxes. They were threatening us. We got threats in the mail from J. Edgar Hoover himself. They went to the offering millions of dollars for us to get off of our lawsuits. And my father said, I'm not interested in money. We've never been interested in the money. It's not about the money. And that's the problem here, because in America, it's always about the money. Kent State is a perfect example for us to learn from. If we would ever take off the blinders and look at it as it is, where it was a government action perpetrated against protesters, we have to do things like what you do, Mickey, with Project Censored, just steadfastly demanding that we know the truth of these stories. And it's up to us. It's not up to the media, the paid media. They're paid off. Let's get real. Corporate owned. To make peace, we have to go for the truth. But we also have to teach it. We have to teach that it's really important and that truth matters. We don't do that. I recently had a session with the Emerson College and the students there were talking to me and they were saying, wow, I never learned Kent State. These kids, they never heard about it. They never learned about it. And they looked at me, they said, did you know this? And I said, listen, I've lived it. I mean, this story has been censored since day one because it doesn't sit well. My sister said flowers are better than bullets the day before she was killed. The government doesn't like that story. And that is a big theme of the May 4th Kent State massacre, that my sister said that. And the next day that she was slaughtered by a bullet. I mean, that that story is forgotten. It's conveniently forgotten by our government, by Kent State University, for those who want to foster this false narrative. And the false narrative, it stops us from healing. It stops us from ever dealing with the pain and coming to terms with it and making peace with it. You have to have truth in order to have peace. And finally, my personal goal here is for the protection of protesters today. Whatever happened to my sister and her friends and every other protester that has faced horrible government violence and death, this must never happen again in America. It is highly illegal for the U.S. government to be killing protesters. We're coming into a difficult time now. I have worries. I'm concerned. We have to stop this. And the only way that we do that is... Everyone that's a protester has to understand that they have protester rights. This is a broadband issue. It's what connects us all. Let's connect together and let's begin our movement anew. Four dead in Ohio. Oh. 
You're tuned to the Project Censored Show on Pacifica Radio. I'm Mickey Huff, your host, and this is the KPFA, sorry, Spring Fun Drive. And we are in the midst of very trying times, a pandemic, and we really need resources like community radio and free speech radio to get information to the public about the communities in which they live. And KPFA is a vital and vibrant resource for that. And here we are in the midst of this and in the midst of the pandemic, and we are trying to keep the station healthy And we're trying to keep the station viable as a great community resource. And the way we do that, you know, is that we have to come to the airwaves and we have to ask kindly and graciously for any support you can offer. 800-439-5732 is that number to call. 800-439-5732. You can pledge securely online at kpfa.org. We're sharing this program with you today, facing the Kent State Massacre, the 50th anniversary, the Kent State 50th teach-in. This is all original programming that I put together with Laurel Krauss and the Kent State Truth Tribunal. You can go to truthtribunal.org to see more of it. It's all available there for free, but we're sharing special excerpts with you today in support of the Project Censored Show. And because this kind of information is exactly the kind of programming that belongs on KPFA and the People's Airwaves. It's the people's history of this Vietnam War period when the war came home and when people were being shot on college campuses for resisting war and for fighting to demand an end to the draft and for a society based on principles of peace and unity, not on war and destruction. 800-439-5732. That's the number to call to support this kind of programming. We're trying to raise $3,000 this hour, but we only need 20 people to call in at $150 or more, and we make this goal. And I know that some people can't give any money, and we appreciate any support that you can give. Sharing KPFA is a resource. I share it in the classroom. A lot of great programs here. I always try to spread the word of the great programming on this station. Uh, It's an honor to be here. And so I'm here to do my part to try to raise money and support for this station. And you can help me do that. This program's in its 10th year. We're on about 50 stations around the U.S., the Project Censored show is. You can learn more at projectcensored.org. But we're here trying to support KPFA and also Sweet Relief. They provide immediate assistance for musicians and people in the music industry. These are people that are struggling right now. And this is a nonprofit that helps donate to help relieve musicians, the Sweet Relief Musicians Fund. And that's the one that we chose today on the program. We all receive so much from music. I'm a longtime musician myself. I was a professional musician for 25 years. I know how difficult it is to really make a living at music and be an artist and maintain integrity. And I know a lot of people that are struggling. And so anything we can do to help support that sweet relief is going to be one of the recipients of some of the funding we raised today for this program. But we need to get that support. 800-439-5732. Hey, KPFA, we need you. 800-HEY-KPFA to call in right now and support this program, the Project Censored Show, but of course the entire station during these very difficult and trying times where you're getting frontline top-notch journalism. I was able to share part of the COVID Chronicles with you uh, from the Along the Line podcast as part of a Project Censored show. Nick Baham's work, hearing from people all around the country how they're handling the COVID-19 crisis. I've had scholars on talking about media bias, propaganda, mis- and disinformation around that. So we're doing our part at Project Censored to keep the public informed and advocate critical media literacy, critical thinking, civil discourse, and the like. But we need your help now to keep the lights on at this station and keep the broadcast going. 800-439-5732. 800-439-5732. 20 callers call in at $150 and we are good to go, but anybody can call in and pledge any amount. One person could pledge all three grand. We could get 100 people calling in if that's possible. Whatever we can do. We know it's tough times and it's hard to be asking right now when so many people are in need, but we want to make sure we keep our communication platforms open. We don't want the only communications platforms to be ones controlled by corporate owners and advertisers and big pharma and big agriculture and the military industrial complex. We need people's media and KPFA is that resource and Pacifica is that resource and the Project Censored Show 
is part of that mission to provide the untold histories, to provide you with the news that doesn't make the news and give you analysis weekly. This is our 10th year. You can learn more at projectcensored.org. But right now, we'd love it if you could call in 800-439-5732, kpfa.org. You're listening to the Project Censored Show. I'm your host, Mickey Huff. As we wrap up today's program, looking at the 50th anniversary of the Kent State Massacre, we are reminded why history matters. And we hope these perspectives enrich your understanding of the important events that took place May 4, 1970 at Kent State and thereafter at Jackson State as well. In this last segment, we share with you remarks from DeRay McKesson. It's a member of a new generation of peace and justice activists, Going back to Ferguson, to Black Lives Matter, DeRay talked to us about why the lessons of Kent State still matter today. When I think about Kent State, I remember learning about Kent State on a really surface level before I sort of dove into activism in this way. And it was four students get killed by the National Guard for pushing back against the government's intervention in Vietnam and a host of other social ills. And it made me think about two things. One is that when we think about like the long trajectory of civil rights, We've actually gotten a lot of wins. Housing, desegregation, education, health, like definitely not where we want to be, but a lot of wins. The police is actually one of the only institutions that is as bad or worse than when the fight started. So like National Guard isn't any more respectful of people's lives. The police aren't any more respectful. Like it is sort of the same. The numbers are the same. Like it is still sort of while even when we think about this moment of COVID, it's like we just did analysis and the rate of police violence in March of 2020 is the same as it was in March of 2019. So even with the lockdown, shutdown, like the police behavior is largely unchanged. So when I think about Kent State, I think about what it means that we see young people rise up, we see young people take action, we see young people unarmed, only armed with the truth standing in streets and saying like, this is unacceptable and being met with sheer violence, right? The second is I'm like just in awe of how something that happened in the 70s uh, is essentially still happening today. That the violence of the police and the police apparatus is as consistent as anything we've ever seen. You know, it's interesting that you say that. A couple of the other conversations I've had with people that were active at the time, they made those connections and saying that there's still a struggle, particularly around state violence. This is definitely a thread, a characteristic of our state, of our society, that we maybe haven't learned a lot of lessons from. So going back to Kent State, Jackson State, 50 years later, what, DeRay, could you say about the current political and human rights struggle that we are still dealing with? I think that if there's any macro lesson I learned in the street in St. Louis and then in all the other places that followed was that there's this myth of what it means to be an organizer. There's this myth, there's like a really academic understanding that says that the only people who organize are people who have read all the theory, they have been to 15 workshops. And it's like, let me tell you, when we were in the street in St. Louis, none of us were steeped in organizing theory. But, you know, we often say that people have the experiences before they had the language. We knew what abolition was because we knew what it meant in our lives before we had the language of abolition. We knew what intersectionality was with our lives before we had the language of it. But there's a way that dominant culture even reinforces itself amongst marginalized communities that says that the only way to really be real, the only way to be validated is to have the language around these things. And if there's anything I've learned is that people had the innate skills to organize already. They do. People didn't need 15 workshops and three documentaries to be like, oh, the elderly person next to me probably need some food, right? Like people didn't, people didn't need the NAACP or any national organizing group to come to St. Louis and say, you know what, I think it's unacceptable that they not only kill Mike Brown, but left his body in the street for four and a half hours. Like we didn't need critical essays about that to take action. So that's one, is that people have the skills. Part of our work is people who organize is to help people unlock those skills. The second is like, what does it mean to organize? Is that organizing at its root is always it is always grounded in structural change, like systemic change. There are a lot of other things that are really good. Mobilizing, programming, activism, protest, all that is great. 
if it doesn't lead, if the end goal isn't some structural change and like, it's not organizing and that's not like a bad thing. It just is like, a, is what it is. Right. <laughs> the third thing is that when I think about the police, one of the things that we realized in 2015 was that if we focus on these singular moments of trauma, we'll never win because the worst or like the most intense consequence that'll come out of a singular moment of trauma will be accountability for the officer. That is sort of like the thing that happens with the police. There's some other things that like, you know, we get one missing white kid and then all of a sudden we have a whole Amber Alert, right? But like with the police, because the police normally terrorize people of color, it's like one just, just never is like enough to change the landscape. And, you know, it's this push about how do we make sure that we don't let people confuse accountability and justice? That accountability is what happens after the trauma. Justice is the idea that the trauma shouldn't exist in the first place. It's why we double down on so much of the data and understanding the rules and understanding the policies and laws, because we were like, yeah, we could totally stand in the street again when somebody gets killed, but like, we've just never, that's never changed the structure, right? Like that, it just hasn't. And, and that's something that I'm always mindful of. The last thing I'll say is that since the protest in 2014, the police have killed more people, not less. It didn't get better, got worse. The only bright spot is that there's actually been a, a statistically significant decrease in cities it's been an increase everywhere else. But the places that have had a decrease has been structural change. Like that is like what has happened. It wasn't random. There's been like sustained pressure that either we moved out a set of leaders or we changed some rules and policies, but something at the structural level happened that made this possible. There's so much about the policing apparatus that people really don't know. So like I will hear, oh, the police solve crimes, they keep communities safe. Even the metric that they use is really low, right? Like in a lot of major cities, the solve rate is like 30%, which means that they didn't even think they found somebody for the majority of the cases. And, and they don't even track conviction data because that is so low, right? So like, it, it's actually not happening in the way people think it's happening. So that's a part of it. The police at their best normally get there after the bad things already happen, right? We want to create a world where the bad things don't happen. Well, that's an incredible vision. And certainly looking back at our history, we, we really need to learn those lessons. Do you have any parting advice for us, for our listeners, as we're looking back 50 years, what happened at Kent State, Jackson State? We've got a lot of work cut out for us. You shared a lot of your wisdom with your book from a couple of years back. If people aren't familiar with that, they could certainly learn a lot from your work. Your book was On the Other Side of Freedom. I think the only lesson I'll say is I'm always mindful of who becomes a casualty of these situations. It's always the people with the least amount of power. It's students who are just like outside. It's, it's the poorest people who are in the street, who their bodies are used as disposable things by the state in ways that we know are unacceptable. But I'm also shocked at how quickly people forget. Like I even think about Ferguson. It was not too long ago. And the number of people who don't remember us being in the street for 400 days is still wild to me. People talk to us like we were in the street for like two weekends. It's like, it was a long 400 days. And I never want people to forget like the cost of it. And I will hear people say things like, oh, I just couldn't come. I couldn't make it. And it's like, neither could we. All of us sacrificed something. It was easier for all of us to stay home. So I'm not really interested in like you telling me you couldn't come. What is true is you didn't come. And I'm okay with that. But don't make it sound like you had way more to lose than everybody else, and therefore you didn't. And I think about all the young people at Kent State, Jackson, all these people who, like, it would have been so much easier for them to stay home, to stay in the dorm, to go home, to phone it in, and they chose not to. And part of our work is to always honor that. Well, Doreen McKesson, thanks so much for, for your advice, for sharing your thoughts and uh, thanks so much for your activism. It's actually just part of your everyday existence, part of your life. And I think if all of us take that advice that you just gave and show up, show up and be part of those things that happen, we can make more of those larger structural changes that we're still looking for. So thanks so much for your time and your work, DeRay. <laughs> You're tuned to the Project Censored Show, and I'm your host, Mickey Huff. This is the APFA Spring Fund Drive, and we are asking for your support today. We're sharing exclusive programming on Kent State's 
This is the 50th anniversary and commemoration of the May 4, 1970 massacre at Kent State and later at Jackson State. So we're sharing a series of eight original interviews that we did as part of the Kent State Truth Tribunal Project. We're sharing that with you today on the Project Censored Show in hopes that you will call in and support this kind of programming and most importantly support Free Speech Radio at KPFA 94.1 FM. 800-439-5732. 800 439-5732. Four three nine five seven three two. Please call in and support KPFA during these difficult times if you can. Pledge securely online at kpfa.org. Please keep the calls coming. We want, 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 we want a smash, crash, mash, mash, blast the system. We want to get it hype, get it live, get with the mission. We want the crowd loud, push, pump, and rhythm is hitting. Supporting human conditions, not free market propaganda and corrupt politicians. Cause they own my special ultra truths that fund their campaign. That's why you hear the same old things they claim, but change never came. You've been listening to the Project Censored show, highlighting today our Kent State teach-in. You can learn more about these interviews at projectcensored.org and truthtribunal.org. You've been listening to the Project Censored show. I'm your host, Mickey Huff. I co-founded the program with Peter Phillips in 2010 at KPFA in Berkeley, California. 94.1 FM, kpfa.org. This program is syndicated on Pacifica Radio across the country. Our producer is Anthony Fest. Our associate producer is Dennis Murphy. To learn more about the Project Censored show, go to projectcensored.org. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Please feel free to contact us through projectcensored.org about program ideas or feedback. Last but not least, we are grateful for all of you, our listeners, and we hope you're staying well in our trying times. Citizens in the times for the master thief, combine, conquer, steal, and masterpiece. Open your eyes and realize what's happening. Time's running out the reach on potential fame at the table, then you probably on the menu. We got that love. This is Brian Edwards Teekert from Upfront. Right now, everybody at KPFA is doing incredible work to get useful, sometimes literally life saving information onto the airwaves. We're also trying to figure out how to pay the bills during this crisis. Our spring fund drive is going to be hard because, under shelter in place conditions, we can't staff a phone room and we can't run a thank you gift mailing operation. At the same time, We are trying to shrink the fund drive so that it takes less airtime away from our emergency coverage. We want to ask you to help by donating early. Go to kpfa.org right now. We'll put your donation towards shrinking the length of the fund drive. Again, that's www.kpfa.org. Click donate at the top and thank you. Hey, don't cut that driver off. Cut off that nonsense you're listening to on the radio. And put it on 94.1 KPFA. Starting at 3 p.m. for your daily digest of independent analysis, investigation, and activism on Rising Up with Sonali, followed by news, views, and hip-hop on Hard Knock Radio at 4. Then it's hard-hitting frontline investigative reporting on Flashpoints at 5, followed by a comprehensive wrap-up of the day's news and events with the Pacifica Evening News at 6. That's weekday afternoons starting at 3 p.m. on KPFA and kpfa.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 
K248BR in Santa Cruz and online worldwide at kpfa.org.